I met so many investors who told me, oh my God, this is a graveyard of companies. Don't go into primary education. Districts are tough. They're bureaucratic, no funding rates, um, just really the worst dynamics that, um, that you might want in a business. Hey, co-founders, welcome to Made It with Connor Tompkins, a podcast where we meet with badass entrepreneurs who've successfully exited their companies, discussing everything from the wins and losses of entrepreneurship to the next steps after the exit. To not miss out on these exciting stories, be sure to subscribe wherever you get podcasts. Let's dive in. Hey, everyone. I am here with Vlada uh, Lukina. Did I say that correctly? That's right. She is the founder of Class Tag. She's also an immigrant founder and has done some fantastic and wonderful things in education and in the tech space. So I want to hand it over to you and hear a little bit about your origin story and how you founded the business. Super. Well, thank you. I'm excited to be here. My story starts from Ukraine. I loved my early start as entrepreneur back in Ukraine, actually growing up alongside my dad, who's an entrepreneur. So I got to inherit that and, and sort of uh, get my first um, steps as an entrepreneur alongside him. And then I wanted to learn the proper way to do business, which in my book meant uh, MBA, big companies and things like that. So I applied to top three business programs, got it to Wharton in the U.S., shipped myself overseas, spent about a decade at Boston Consulting Group and climbing corporate ladder at Dell, two levels down from Michael Dell. Then I realized that big companies actually are just a lot of people, but really entrepreneurship <laughs> is where my passion is. And that's perhaps the most honest or the most truthful way to see what you're worth. Because the past steps with you, you can't really uh, rely on this large infrastructure and all the various people, resources, et cetera, that you have in a large company. And so about that time, my daughter started school in New York City. And I was receiving communications from the school. And frankly, I was shocked. It was flyers in the backpack, sign up sheets on the door. And obviously in a day and age when we know what our friends eat for breakfast on Instagram, whether we want it or not, it's crazy that you can have the same level of connectivity with your child. That brought idea of class tag, really helping parents and teachers become partners in the kids' education. And that's the platform I started with a dad in the same class. His son and my daughter were classmates. He became a CTO and I became the CEO of this uh, company. We scaled that to 5 million users, raised funding, and ultimately exited. And that's my story in a nutshell. <laughs> that's a big win. Not a lot of companies exit. What was your dad doing? As an entrepreneur. So my dad actually uh, was an entrepreneur during the collapse of Soviet Union. That was the most fun time. I actually regret that I can be entrepreneur in that time because it was really wild west. So whatever company you start, you can be the first to market. He started maybe 15 companies and they were all different, right? So one of them was producing coats, another one was producing hats, another one was a little cinema in an office space or apartment he was renting, really retail, tons of stuff, because you could be really on a limb with very little funding and just a lot of entrepreneurial spirit, you could be first to market with anything. Isn't that incredible? After the collapse of the Soviet Union, they were like, real estate was open. You could be the first to market to if you opened up a mine or opened up, you said a cinema, a hat shop. His uh, brother immigrated to United States. When he visited him, he brought a DVR. I think he was one of few people in the whole city that actually had the DVR. He rented out a space. He put on the DVR with, I think it was called Police 3 or whatever that movie was. And so it kept playing and, um, he had a big audience. As a kid, maybe I was selling tickets or whatever I was doing. <laughs> you were selling things when you were, you were a kid. That's a, kind of the beginning right. of an entrepreneurship, right? Yes, exactly. And I think just having that front row seat to that craziness. He was an engineer by his education who worked at a factory until you, you know, Soviet Union collapsed. And then he just went all out and doing all sorts of crazy entrepreneurial things. And it was just so fun to watch and participate in. When you look at the economic development post-Soviet Union, a big spike over seven to nine years of like just businesses being developed and then access to the global economy, 
is he still an entrepreneur or did he end up selling those businesses? Did the cinema take off? Did the hat <laughs> company not? Like what, what happened with this, with all these different companies that he had? Obviously, one of the things being part of a developing economy is that it's always developing and has a lot yeah. of twists and turns, even more so, right? Here, we talk about COVID and how much uh, it impacted business as well in country like Ukraine, let alone what's happening now. There is a big shift and a big sort of event happening every couple of years, right? The complete right. devaluation of currency or this or that or this crisis, right? So you have to be so agile and on your feet to run business there. So to answer your question, he um, and sort of evolve his businesses, his latest business is in renewable energy, which is sort of uh, more consistent with the times. And unfortunately, because of the war in Ukraine, it is challenging to run these businesses. My heart goes out to old entrepreneurs who continue to employ people, who continue to try and run businesses no matter what. And he and other entrepreneurs like that are my heroes for sure. That's remarkable. I remember seeing video footage of an office. It looked like my tech office. We have the standing desks and everything like that. And then you see footage post what happened with the war in, in Ukraine. And it doesn't look anything similar to what it looked like before. I can't imagine running a company in this environment or trying to work with customers and trying to make sure your employees are safe. Everyone is taken care of. Um, that's a scary and, and hard thought. Absolutely. And as we know, running a business is hard enough in itself. Finding yeah. a problem that people want to pay for and that you are differentiated in a competitive market and yada, yada, yada. And yet that's like 20% of the things that these people have to worry about. 80% is really the livelihood of the people and their safety and just so many other political factors that they need to think about beyond just the core business as we know it. My outsourcing company had a couple thousand people in the Philippines and we had the pandemic and they shut down the highways and there were safety concerns. And we were worried about how do you get people home? Did you have to navigate those type of concerns with the war in Ukraine as a founder and going through your process? Absolutely. And I still remember that day that the war started. And, you know, of course, having not only my team and family there, I was, you know, very closely following the news. I offered the team to relocate um, a couple of weeks and months before that. They said, absolutely no, nobody would leave that this war is, is happening. And so the morning off, we had our all hands. And I remember all my U.S. staff messaging me saying, hey, maybe we should cancel because of what's happening. And I said, absolutely not. While folks in Ukraine are dealing with this, we just need to work harder and we have to be strong for them because as long as we run the business, as long as we accelerate our sales, that's how we can support them. We are not going to support them if we just sit here and go crazy because, yes, that's what everyone wants to do is just to paralyzing. It's so incredibly challenging to deal with it. And so we did help hold the old hands. Some of the Ukrainians actually joined, believe it or not, from underground and wherever they were hiding. And the team really pulled together. We had some operations with some other folks that were based in Europe to help connect folks to evacuation opportunities. We had a live chat to do that. And we even were singing Ukrainian an anthem with American colleagues to lift uh, up one of the employees who was hiding with her small daughter and was just not in a good place mentally. And so that lifted her up and I gave her strength to run to the train station in Kiev and take that train to Poland and get to a more safe location. Are all of your employees now in safe locations? Or... Many are still in Ukraine. Yeah, they okay. didn't want to move or could move because a man between the ages of 18 and 60, they cannot yes. leave the country unless they have three kids or some other special circumstances. Makes sense. My wife is Ukrainian and her uncle is like 63 and we're looking at the age cutoff and we're like, they could increase it to 65, you don't know. And then you're trying to figure out the logistics of how to get them over the border. And that's stressful. Anyone is prepared to deal with for sure. Absolutely not. You ended up selling class tag. Would you mind sharing about what that MA process was like? And then what was that process like in regards to the war happening in Ukraine? I would say that before we actually 
sold class ag. We went initially through a process 18 months prior to that. As I was ra raising our Series A, we got approached to sell the business and it was a really compelling offer. After a lot of deliberation, I just had to give in. The partners were flying to see me. They were calling me. And so there was just a lot of convincing happening. And so we went with that m and offer, which meant that we locked down for that exclusivity period for maybe three months or so. And as luck or unluck <laughs> had it, we got uh, to the very last mile in that m and process right before the war started in Ukraine. I always believe that whatever happens, happens for the best. Yeah. But at that time, I would say professionally, that was one of the toughest things I had to persevere uh, through. Uh, and that was when at the 11th hour, when I was collecting signatures from investors, the last minute negotiation about some tax treatments, those fine details on the deal, diligence was done, technology diligence, everything was done. We got on a call with them and they said, we are not going to do the deal. And I honestly, I couldn't speak for probably 48 hours. I just couldn't. It's a hard process to go through, period. I know. And I think that um, honestly, that's something I want to share with other first time entrepreneurs who are thinking about m and or getting m and opportunities in their inbox. One thing I wish I knew as a first-time founder is that I think 90% of m and deals fall apart. And I just did not know. I had no idea. Have I known the statistics? I should have raised, let's say, Series A and then got back to these folks and say, amazing, let's now have a conversation, right? And I just have a lot more cash in the bank, but we can still you know, continue the conversation. So I think that it is really important at all times to have optionality. And as a first time entrepreneur, that actually taught me a lot about going through the process second time. And that's why it went so smoothly, right? And second time we had to, to uh, multiple offers. We hired investment banker. It was a proper process with all the steps and stages in place. And then I just operated the business as if no M&A process is happening. My goal was to have a thriving business, M&A or not. I didn't care about it. In the conversations that we've been having over the past few weeks, that seems to be a common thread. Like this business needs to run and stand on its own. And if you want to buy the business and you want to partner together, great. But if not, then I'm just going to be over here doing my own thing and there's also nothing better than being like, hey, you can also buy the business a year from now, but it's not going to be the same price and we're going to be growing. I think investors as well as potential M&A partners can kind of tell or, or kind of sense that if you're like, we're doing this with or without you. Exactly. And I think that first experience gave me a lot of confidence. That's the only way to go. Mm -hmm. And even... In my mind, I already decided and with the board, we gained alignment that that was a plan A to actually sell the business. I knew that we are perfectly capable of plan B and yeah. that we have a thriving, profitable business that can keep going if this doesn't happen. And I think that just puts us in a whole different position in negotiation. I think so too. Like you just have to be able to walk away. Did you have a formal board that you were working with or reporting to? We did have a formal board and that was formed later on after the first M&A didn't happen. And okay. so we got a more structured governance in place for the business. It's funny that my co-founder and CTO, as I mentioned, was a dad in my daughter's class. He started a number of companies in the past and had experience with boards. He said, be careful, don't, you know, don't run, don't rush into having a formal board. Somehow we just had a good relationship, good communication with uh, investors, but we didn't have a formal board until sort of that uh, experience. Board management's kind of a skill that no one talks about, but how to make sure that the board is an advocate for you and, and can help you with the process. Do you feel like that was part of the difference between the first process and the second one? There were a difference was investment banker. And so that okay, yeah. also took some pressure off 
me as the, the only eyes and ears on the front lines of what what's really happening. And as a more independent party, I think that it also, we had a pretty substantial cap table with over 30 investors. The fact that we had a few major investors on the board allowed for that representation and effective communication. Overall, I've been really blessed with very supportive investors. Many of them were founders in the past. Some of them were really experts in education and so really cared about the mission as well as um, the outcome financially as well. Just uh, really thrilled to have shared this journey with some amazing people. Hey listeners, a year ago, I started working with Taylor Robinson Music, a go-to place for people that are looking to learn any instrument, whether it's a garage band or a band and orchestra. They have a network of over 10,000 different instructors. They have locations around the United States. Check them out. Cheers. How has it been after the deal went through? How are how are you doing and what are some of the things that, that make you excited? The second time I was operating as if I'm not selling the business, when yeah. I sold it, I didn't feel anything, to be honest. I didn't even feel that I sold it because I kept, I kept going on that momentum. And so um, I would say the first few months were actually really busy because of the integration and how critical the role of Classic is in the ecosystem of other companies as part of this strategic acquisition. And so I wanted to make sure that my team is properly integrated and gets opportunity for growth. I wanted to make sure that the platform is well understood and so it lands well. And we have uh, millions of users in the platform. That was important to me as well. And I was busy just with that whole process. And so until three days ago that I'm officially not part of the acquiring company, I actually didn't feel like I've exited beyond just the fact that I financially feel much more secure. Congratulations on the actual exit. And then this like almost secondary wave of exit right. um, over the past three days, what have you been feeling? Excited about um, opportunities and excited about the world of possibilities. It's so fun to feel like, you know, you don't have 50 things on your plate. And I know a lot of founders go through the downs of it um, and and sort of um, maybe because of this delayed uh, exit in my mind, I didn't feel it. I, I, I feel great. I feel excited for what's next. I love connecting with other entrepreneurs and dreaming up what the future holds. Well, let's talk about that. What are some things that are exciting to you? As I reflect on my experience, um, effectively what I have expertise in is management consulting, which I've done decades of and uh, being a founder over the the remaining eight years of my uh, professional career. And if you blend the two, it's it's really, I think, lends itself well with coaching and supporting other entrepreneurs. I am very passionate about idea of product market fit and focusing in on what's working and untangling that signal, right? And I think as a founder, I found that hard to do because you have a lot of things that sort of are working and then you end up with a multi-layered key that is really hard to untangle over time rather than figuring out where the signal is, where is that persona and how to go pursue it. And I have as a a immigrant founder, have a soft spot for immigrant founders. And so I've been spending a lot of time supporting Immigrant founders who want to enter U.S. market, perhaps they have a business that they want to bring to U.S. or folks that, on the contrary, are looking at international expansion. That's something that I don't think U.S. businesses spend enough time thinking about. And there is a whole world out there. I honestly think it's fantastic because I get it really excited whenever I hear about a company taking something that either works in one market and taking it to another one. You hear about Rocket Internet and they take Amazon and they're like, I'm going to take this to the Philippines and it's going to be called Lazada. You can do that and then you can also do the reverse and say like, hey, this is really working uh, well in Portugal and we can, it doesn't exist here. And it kind of creates its own moat, right? Because you already know mm-hmm. it's a proven idea. Have you seen any <laughs> good examples of this or any cool other immigrant founders or companies that are doing this really well? That have done that transition? Um yeah. That's a good question. Um, I um, I certainly know some, but they wouldn't be big names as of yet, right? So there are early days in in entering the market. Specifically, the few founders I'm working with are from Latin America or Europe at the moment. And I think, especially in this world where 
the world is uh, taking over by AI a bit by bit, right? I think yeah. what's deeply human is that culture, as you said, your origin story. And I think as you talk about sort of cultural differences and things like that, there are a lot of really cool businesses that can transport that culture and that flavor, uh, but also um, a lot of great opportunities to just scale a proven idea in one market and figure out where else you can go, creating just a tremendous opportunity for growth. In college, we had a program called Isaac, which was like an international exchange of young people. So they can go work mm -hmm. for like PwC in like Mexico City or, or uh, Coke in Korea. And like you have that international exchange of like young people and ideas. You could hire people in your city, but you can also find the best talent if you were to search nationally and even more if you were to go internationally. It's like a no brainer. Did you have that experience? Because I know you have ties to Ukraine and your team was international. Did you find that was like a unique differentiator and had an impact on you? Absolutely. And I think from day one, we decided it will be fully remote. So we were fully remote before remote became a thing and the forced transition. And so we had support team in Philippines. We had development team and product team in Ukraine. We had folks in all sorts of odd places from Singapore to Portugal to UK, just because we found great talent in those locations. In the US, they were also spread out across the country. I think as long as you have great communication mechanisms and a way to build culture around the core team, it becomes really fun. I know for a fact that a number of American colleagues who joined ClassTag, they were saying, oh my God, I joined this company. You're only 40 people, but you have 40 countries <laughs> in this one place, right? That's so fun. Um, what were some things that made your experience a little different when you were launching your business as an immigrant founder versus, um, say, someone that um, grew up here and, and probably had a different experience than you did? It might sound strange, but I only recently realized that I'm an immigrant founder <laughs> because I didn't think of myself as such, right? And so as I was building the business, I was just building it. Yes, it's hard. Yes, you get 100 no's for every yes and, you know, just keep going with it. And only recently when I started talking to founders and they say, well, you know, as an immigrant founder, how do I start? How do I do this? And, you know, how do I build a network? And that actually opened my eyes and said, gosh, I am an immigrant founder. I think there are a lot of labels, right? Female tech founder, immigrant tech founder, whatever other things. Yes. And, and there are biases and there are some barriers and all of this stuff is true. But I just feel that it's not helpful to put that label on myself and then say that I can't do something because of that label. When in fact, all I need to do is to embrace my strengths. So I'd rather focus on my unique, I, I don't know, accent, if you will, or I don't know, sense of humor or whatever else there is that differentiates me rather than things that hold me back. How Does remarkable that... is like your background too. And like what your dad went through and in the Soviet Union, when he was launching, you got to see someone right. launch 12 businesses instead of one. Right. That's not a normal experience. It's a special one. And so right. I think there's something to celebrate there for sure. When you were talking about helping founders and helping pay it forward, I think it would be fun to have almost like an accelerator where you're like, hey, you have a great business here in Uruguay. Let's like look at bringing it here to the States and we'll help you with connections and distribution channels and vendors and stuff like that. There's definitely something there where I think it, it would be a fun project. That's in line with what, with what I'm thinking and, and starting to test out. So if you're an international founder listening to this, reach out. I think that with the kind of push for remote culture, it opens up a lot of channels and opportunities for international companies to expand their reach and who they work with. Are you seeing any of that in your company and, and some of the companies that you're working with? That they're reaching out as, as distributors? Yeah, and it's easier to enter markets almost. Like it's easier to hire people in the Philippines than it was before. And vice versa, it's easier for Philippines companies to enter the American market because if you are working with the companies on the back end or if you're launching a product, you can enter a market that you can previously enter if you didn't have a physical presence there. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the reality is that, especially in the software space, right, every business in a way is a global business, whether you want it or not. So for example, when we launched ClassTag, I remember there was an article in Greece and all of a sudden we got 10,000 Greek users overnight. And I was like, 
damn it, like we are not, <laughs> you know, we we didn't count on it. We didn't go through the GDPR. So we just closed it that same day. It was like, no, we can't have, have uh, EU users, but you never know, right? Your stuff is out there and you know, an article can be written and all of a sudden you have a business in a new place. And of course, I think the whole mantra is to be proactive, right? To proactively look for those opportunities uh, in, in different uh, geographies and to enter. But the reality is, especially in software business, you can have 10,000 Greek users any day. That's pretty awesome. How did you scale class tag to 5 million people? That's a lot of users. I still remember that moment when I would travel and or talk to other parents and they're like, oh my God, I'm using it or my friend teacher is using it, et cetera. And so I think when you reach that number pretty much anywhere in, in the country uh, or in Greece, as we learned, <laughs> you can meet uh, those users. And so it's really fun. But how we scaled was the first hundred users by hand. I interviewed a lot of parents, had teachers of their kids. And so I got those 100 users effectively in New York City, where I lived at the time. And then from there, we started really scaling through that early advocacy group of these 100 teachers. And maybe that's how we got to about 1,000 teachers when they started inviting others. And what's cool about teachers, as well as a lot of vertical SaaS solutions, is when people like something, they will share, right? And mm -hmm. so a lot of our messaging and marketing was teachers sharing with other teachers, whether that was actual advertising of teachers talking about it or, um, or webinars of teachers, but it was always teacher to teacher as the central idea of the marketing. And then from there, just started scaling it was <clears throat> amplifying some paid advertising for the back to school, which was the most cost effective time to, to scale before school year starts. So you weren't selling into the school districts and like the principals and stuff like that, right? In my early days of um, fundraising for ClassTag, I met so many investors who told me, oh my God, this is a graveyard of companies. Don't go into primary education. Districts are tough. They're bureaucratic. No funding, right? Um, just really the worst um, the dynamics that, um, that you might want in a business. That lesson was so ingrained in my head that... I avoided so selling to districts until they started coming to us. Like, they started coming to us when we had enough sort of critical math, but we also had COVID, which was a big catalyst for digitalization of communication and the importance of community building in, in schools and in, in public education in, in America. We started getting inbound from these districts, and that's a much easier way to sell. <laughs> Did you see a massive lift when COVID went through? Yeah. So it was really interesting because of our model, which was bottom up, right? Sort of teachers adopting it in their classroom. The day COVID happened in that week, it was spreading like wildfire. My cell phone didn't stop because my the teachers were calling me and begging to let them use class tag because their schools and districts basically told them, we can't, right? We need to be in control. We need to be in charge. We need to have this system. And so they were finding my cell phone to, to ask for help. It's like, can you call oh, my wow, district? Yeah. I want to use your platform. They're not letting me do something. And I was like, I can't really help you unless you actually go to your district and tell them to call me, then I can help you and sell them the platform for, for their whole district. And so that what started that whole inbound. So in a way, short term, it, brought our users down, but then it brought them up from the enterprise side. Did you see the uh, pods like where teachers were spinning out and taking, say, like six to nine students and they were doing pretty well, like they were making more money working with fewer students directly um, than they were in the public school system? I think that's what's happening in education is that it, it a lot of things just didn't go back to the old normal, right? There is a new right. normal in education. And so there are virtual schools now, right? So for example, my daughter says, hey, I actually don't like how the, you know, geometry is taught. I want a virtual option. Apparently public schools today offer virtual options, right? I, who knew, right? Before COVID, I don't think that was a possibility. Then you have a homeschooling that is on the rise and a huge trend. You have these small schools 
that are popping up across the whole country. And in fact, there are so many interesting entrepreneurial opportunities in that kind of homeschooling, kind of small, uh, semi-private space that are really amazing. So it, it is, education is one of those laggy, laggards that yeah, takes a sure. long time to change, but it is going through quite a bit of transformation. I hope it does change a little bit because I feel like if you have access to the best professors or the best teachers in the world, you can't go back to doing it the same way. I also feel like there's a little bit of a shift towards like practical education. It makes me happy whenever I see entrepreneurs on like TikTok or YouTube and they're showing kids like, here's how you like change a tire. Here's how you change out a breaker and your breaker board. And I think that's amazing. 100%. And I think that as I reflect on sort of the skills that I actually find practical in life and the skills that I was taught in schools, I, like all of us, I think I find those diverging quite a bit. <laughs> yeah. And take it some practical skills, like you mentioned, or how to manage money, what money is, right? Personal finance. I don't know. Nobody teaches that, but do you have a lot, if you have a little money or a lot of money, you still know, know, need to know how to manage it regardless. And that's not a subject. Yeah. The fact that you go through 18 years and then you're expected to pay taxes, but that no one thought, oh, maybe that should be a class on mm -hmm. how you actually do that. It's, right. it's shocking. So on your side, as a, a mother of a daughter, what are you thinking? What's going through your head whenever she's, she's going through this and how are you going to help her? I actually have been really open about my entrepreneurial journey, and I think she likes to joke that I'm the least engaged parent who started a parent engagement platform. Oh, ouch. <laughs> which thankfully there are not that many parents, but uh, she's um, you know she's she is sarcastic, and we have beautiful, very close relationship with her. I think in a lot of ways she is proud of uh, of the things I've done. She also has seen the sacrifice that it took to to get mm -hmm. to where. Uh, where I gotten and we do have very, I would say, a very open and advanced conversation. So the other day she was asking me about taking companies public and stock and how does it work and if she buys one stock versus index funds and something because she heard me talking about it. So I don't know that many parents necessarily talk to their kids about it, but she's listening to what I talk about and she's asking me questions. And I think there is a lot of learning that can happen. Through, through that experience and that sharing. Hey, podcast listeners. If you guys are interested in cold email outbound outreach that actually works or thought leadership and how to build a community around some of the things that you're working on, I highly recommend incendiumstrategies.com. They're not just sponsoring this podcast, but they're also helping us with a lot of the communities that we run on the back end. Uh, so if that's something that resonates with you guys and you're interested in learning more, check out incendiumstrategies.com. Thank you guys. And back to the pod. I wanted to ask you about uh, CEO Unboxed. What's the premise? So you're launching a, a podcast. You also have videos that are coming out. What's the focus? I really wanted to put the spotlight on a person and yeah. knowing that a lot of times entrepreneurs put the spotlight on a company and say, oh, my company scaled. My company did this. It sold that problem. But not your company did that. You did that, right? And in parallel, you had your own journey to be a better leader, to cope with whatever personal things you had to cope with and adjust, right? And, and persevere and go through all these crazy roller coasters, which is called entrepreneurship. And so that's what CO Unbox is about, is really talking about lessons learned, about personal qualities, uh, perseverance. Um, life lessons and sort of sharing and imparting that wisdom for other entrepreneurs. So raw, unfiltered stories of CEOs behind company headlines. Has there been some good takeaways from the first uh, 10 episodes? Yes. Um, huh. Um, no journey is easy. Yeah. Every journey is full of twists and turns. I think what I've been really pleasantly surprised by is a lot of entrepreneurs that I'm interviewing are either exited entrepreneurs or they've scaled their company substantially to this point, and people are really humble. I don't know if there is self-selection there, but it's been a really enjoyable to see how people understand the mistakes they've made. Yeah. And 
in a way that doesn't make them feel silly or lose confidence in whatever they're doing, but in a really mature way, talk about the mistakes and missteps and how they would do things differently in a very open way. And I think in a lot of ways, I find that folks that sold their businesses somehow just have the benefit of that reflection period that you just don't have as someone who is grinding every day. You have more space, right? You go talk to people, you tell your story. And so that's, um, I think that there is a lot to learn from those folks because they just spend time reflecting. And I think that self-reflection is perhaps I found to be the most challenging skill to develop, but it's also the most rewarding skill to allow you to grow. It's humbling uh, running a company and then even selling a company because then your identity is broken off and you're trying to figure out who you are next. Um, so it's, I think there's a little bit of that too. I think whenever I talk to younger entrepreneurs, they're all, and there's this bravado there that okay. it's like, I'm going up and to the right. I, everything is great. And then you hear back from them and then the company doesn't exist the next, next week. And you're like, oh, what happened? It was all great until it fell off a cliff. I, I don't think that's necessarily the case. And, and whenever you get to the point where you've sold a business or sold multiple businesses, you've seen how it can go wrong. And you're just grateful that you were able to navigate it around all the corners and bends to make it to where you were. And, and remain composed, right? No, right. no, no matter what. That's, that's a pretty big shift, right? And your anxieties are different. Your anxieties go from like, oh, I have employees I'm responsible for and and I have to like sell this product and sell the service and launch this to um, you don't have as many meetings. You don't you aren't as responsible for as many employees, but you have anxiety as to like maybe what do I do next or family or personal anxieties or or monetary anxieties. Um, and so it's just different. Yeah, exactly. And I think the other thing about entrepreneurs is after you've worked so, so hard, it's also really hard to not do it, right? Get yeah. into a whole new routine. And when your calendar might not be filled up with meetings and you're like, oh, what do I do? Do I just read a book leisurely or what? what, what's, what's there? But I do think that I haven't really honestly taken a, like a proper vacation <laughs> yet. I'm, that's something I'm looking forward to doing this summer for a longer period, but I do think that just slowing down a bit is really important because that allows you for that reflection, but also not, not going off the grid entirely for me, because I know that would set off some other anxieties about why am I not being productive? Why I'm not doing this? And, and so I think that there is this happy medium for me about sparkling the ideas and having kind of enough momentum to to think and grow but also just allowing myself to kind of slow down you don't relax too much <laughs> <laughs> you relax just enough and you stay in the pocket um thank you so much for joining the podcast uh where should people go to find you i am fairly active on linkedin so you can find me by vlada lotkina there i'm um, broadcasting ceo unbox live for various other sessions. I recently launched a newsletter as well. It's called uh, Founders Elevator, specifically focused on product market fit, go-to-market scaling, and other entrepreneurial subjects that I'm particularly passionate about and sharing some tested and proven strategies on that front. That's fantastic. I'm going to include the links below. Uh, Vlada, fantastic to have you. Thank you so much. Really enjoyed it. That wraps up today's episode. For more inspiring stories and valuable lessons from successful entrepreneurs, be sure to listen and subscribe wherever you get podcasts. Thanks for listening. Until next time, keep pushing boundaries and writing your next chapter.